Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Doug Lewin, president of Stoic Energy. We talk about the recent winter snap, how ERCOT is fixing the Texas energy grid, and how Bitcoin miners and other flexible loads fit into the market. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Doug, welcome to the Mining Podcast. Thank you so much for your time today. How are you doing? Good. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, really excited for this conversation. Sort of a follow-up on our last podcast with Phil Janikowski of the Dallas News, where we talked a lot about ERCOT's market problem and how the governor's office, the PUC, ERCOT, Texas Railroad Commission, they're all trying to come up with a novel solution for figuring out how to create an energy market. And I think the follow-up here is an opinion on what that's supposed to look like, since you have an energy background, uh, and what this looks like going forward. And even like going back to Texas Storm Uri and then the the winter snap we just had last week. What is your thoughts on everything that's going on? Because we definitely need a little bit of that on the show. But to begin, if you could give a little intro for our audience and then we'll dive right into the topic. Yeah, for sure. So Doug Lewin, president of Stoic Energy, uh, energy consultant, um, been a consultant for the last four years, but have worked in uh, energy, climate, environment kind of spaces around Texas for almost 20 years now. Um, was a legislative staff for a long time ago, led a nonprofit focused on energy efficiency and demand response, uh, and then worked for a company that implements energy efficiency and demand response programs for utilities around the the, the country. Awesome. Glad to have you on the show today. Don't get a lot of energy experts, so always welcome the expertise. Let's dive into the, the topic itself. And for those who are uh, curious about what's going on with ERCOT and Texas Grid, but aren't familiar with it, you give a high-level summary of the intention or whatever the correct word is, whatever the problem is down in Texas. Yeah. I mean, look, you know, there, there were, there were problems before Yuri, but Yuri obviously was such a, um, you know, sort of a, a transformational kind of a kind of an event, right? It was, it was, um, traumatic and, and shocking. And for any of your listeners that, that live in Texas, you know, pretty much everybody in the state has a story to tell. Um, we were um, fortunate that we were only without wa- uh, power for, for about 12 hours, but we were without water for about five days. Um, and we're, you know, shoveling snow literally to, to melt it, to flush toilets. And it was just an experience you don't expect to have, you know, um, uh, you know, waiting in, in line to get more water at a FEMA site, you know, showing up within 10 minutes of the time it opened and all the water was gone and going, Oh shit. <laughs> you know, like I, I see this stuff on the news. This stuff doesn't happen to me. It happened to 10 million Texans. It was such a vast, uh, event and really just upended life for such a vast number. It was the largest, um, in terms of duration, it was the largest outage in the history of the United States. And, and, and there's not a close second. I mean, it was, it was, um, uh, I'll just say one more thing on that too, is that, you know, as bad as it was, it could have been a lot worse. And I know that's hard for some people to hear, particularly those that were without power and water for four or five days straight as so many Texans were, but the entire grid did not, in fact, go down. Um, had it gone down, we would have had to go into something called Black Start, where you bring it back up power plant by power plant. You have to match each power plant to the exact demand it needs and, and sort of then, then stitch those power plants together with others. And it's a, s- a slow and sometimes painful process, uh, particularly in an area as small. And I know this sounds weird to, to Texans and maybe people outside the state of Texas, but as small as Texas, like usually you would try to bring a grid back up over the area of the size of Europe or the entire Western United States or entire Eastern United States. It's a small geography to try to balance and bring that back. And we have 13 plants we pay in the state to be ready for that. About six of those, well, not about six of those were out. They were not functioning. So like 
had the grid gone down, we may not have been able to get it back. And you start thinking of the implications, I mean, for, for weeks or a month, and you start thinking of the implications of that, like you can't fill your gas tank without power, right? I mean, so like you can't even drive out of the state. Um, it, it just, it would have been, uh, you know, cataclysmic. And, and we actually weren't that far away from that. So major moment in time, major kind of interstitial moment where everybody's like, okay, something has to be done. What's going to be done. And then all the finger pointing started and all that kind of stuff. You had this brief moment where everybody was blaming renewables. There are some people that are still doing that. Unfortunately, um, we now have two major sort of po post-mortems. Um, one uh, by the UT Energy Institute that came out the summer after URI. And then another, the definitive report on URI was from the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And, and what did they say in these reports? The, the, the basic, the, the, the most major causes... And this is really important because if you're going to find a cure, you have to have the proper diagnosis, right? And this is a big part of our problem in Texas and in ERCOT right now is people are trying to solve, in some cases, just the wrong problem. So when we get into talking about market structure here, there's a, there's a big question as to whether the market structure was actually the problem or a lack of regulation was the problem. So what NERC and FERC told us was gas supply... And, and there's different parts of that chain, right, from wellheads to compressor stations and gathering lines through to the pipelines and, and further down the stream where different problems could happen. But, but rich, writ large, the gas production and delivery system was a huge part of that. Again, a lot of freezing at the wellheads, a lot of uh, problems at pipelines. It was kind of distributed without. So I don't want to be too reductive or oversimplify. But... Overall, the gas supply system was a major problem. Uh, the other, and this isn't like an order of priority, these were both sort of equally major problems. Um, the other one was uh, ga mostly gas power plants, though there were problems with every form of power production. One of our, the state's four nuclear plants was offline. 40 plus percent of the state's coal plants were offline. I say the states, that's another thing I want to be careful about. The state doesn't own any of this outside of Lower Colorado River Authority, which is a sort of quasi state agency. These are all private companies um, that um, own and operate those power plants. So, um, and, and wind and solar had problems. There was, there was solar uh, that had snow on top of it, so it wasn't working. It wasn't that sunny out during the beginning of the period. A lot of wind turbines froze up. Um, so you had all these kinds of problems, but the biggest was gas. Gas, we, we lost half of our gas generation fleet. And of course, gas is the biggest part of the, the ERCOT power system. Um, and then just one last thing I'll mention, and this wasn't, it's certainly in the FERC and NERC report, but I don't want to represent that they elevated it to the level of those other two, but I like to elevate it. I think it's really important is demand, right? There's two sides of the equation. We clearly did not have enough supply to meet the demand, but the demand was insane and off the charts. We actually do not know how much demand there was because it couldn't be served. ERCOT estimates that it was 77 gigawatts, but ERCOT has a terrible record at estimating demand, particularly in, in wintertime which we can talk about in regards to the, the, the front that just moved through it a, a little while ago. There's a team of researchers at Texas A&M that estimate that the actual demand during winter storm Uri was 82 gigawatts, which would mean we're a winter peaking system because the most we've ever used in the summer is 80. So that's very, so, so those are the three main things. We had major problems with gas supply and distribution. We had major problems with power plants of all kinds, but gas was the biggest and demand was off the charts. Awesome. Thank you for that summary. Let's dig into the specifics a little bit more. I want to get your opinion on them because I've seen a lot of barbs on Twitter between different like ERCOT accounts or accounts that follow ERCOT, some Bitcoin miners who are also following this. And some are like renewables were the problem because the, the sun wasn't shining and the wind wasn't blowing and we are incentivizing people to build renewables. And I saw on the other side, people were like, well, natural gas fell off a cliff. Even the coal plants weren't operating. Even a nuclear plant was offline. So maybe we can go through like a little bit more concretely and, and find out like what the problem was within within your eyes at the very least because it seems like there's some contention on like whose fault it exactly was 
Yeah, there, there's a lot of contention around this um, among sort of partisans, if you will. But again, I, I think it's really important. I would invite people. It's actually a fairly readable, as far as these kinds of things go, report that that FERC and NERC, the one I was referring to earlier, and I can send you a link and perhaps you can put it in the show notes so people can find it. You know, don't, don't trust me on it. Don't trust what anybody else is saying about it. Read the report for yourself. These are federal investigators, an entire team spent basically every, you know, day of their career over the better part of 2021, interviewing people, looking at data, finding the truth. I like to uh, compare that report to something like what the National Transportation Safety Board does after a plane crash, right? And if you think about it, if there's a plane crash, you want a single point of truth as to what caused that plane crash. You don't want people arguing over it afterwards, right? FERC and NERC is, is the point. And if they say something contrary to what I say, believe them. Right. I mean, I, I we we need those sources of nonpartisan, objective truth. So, such things do exist, right? And and so I think looking at what they tell us, and again, the the major thing they say is this was a a failure of of. I'm paraphrasing. These are my own words. Again, read the report. But the major failure was on on the gas side. Now, I want to be real clear. I, and I try to 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 do this through my communication. Sometimes I'm better than others. Sometimes I, I fail, frankly. This is an integrated system. I, I really hate when these discussions bog down as they often do on Twitter, where you only have 280 characters, but here you and I can talk. We have some more space to talk through this stuff. A lot of times these things are reductive and they and they just boil down to somebody's position is this resource is good and this one is bad. No, no, yours is bad and mine is good. And, and, and this is just like, it's, it's childish and it's, it doesn't give um, anywhere close to the proper um, respect to the complexity and, the, and the, just the, the, the complicated nature of an integrated energy system. So every single resource has benefits and drawbacks every single one of them. There is no perfect energy source yet, right? We heard this news out of DOE a couple weeks ago about fusion. And may, maybe fusion will be the perfect energy source. And, and when I'm you know, old and retired, um, you know, that'll just be power and everything and none of this will matter anymore. Dare to dream. But for now, and for the foreseeable future, for the next several decades, there is no perfect energy source. We, nuclear has radioactive waste. It's very difficult to deal with, right? You can't start up and shut down nuclear very easily. It's going to run kind of constant. It doesn't have that flexibility, right? Um, coal has horrible emissions associated with it, right? Mercury and um, sulfur and all this stuff that is literally deadly, literally kills people, right? Um, gas has a lot of pollution associated with it. It has major, as, as does coal, has major vulnerabilities, uh, particularly in wintertime. Um, uh, wind and solar, obviously intermittent variable resources that you 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 know you're reliant on. You know this is like such an obvious thing, but like detractors of wind and solar say it like it's some kind of like fatal flaw. It just has to be managed. You can only use it when the wind blows and the sun shines. Like that is like the dumbest thing anybody in energy ever says, and I just said it. So, but but the point of that long colloquy is just to say that every resource has its benefits and its drawbacks. And I actually think the winter front that just came through and affected the, the entire country uh, outside of some areas of California, I guess, but basically the entire country, the entire lower 48 anyway. And in Texas, our experience was really interesting because on the 22nd, when this uh, front came in, and it came in really quick, I was outside trying to keep some of my plants alive and wrap them up and stuff. And I went out at noon thinking I had plenty of time. And by 1.30, man, it was cold. That wind was whipping. So, so the wind was whipping, right? We had wind chills that drove demand off the chart, right? Because it's really wind chill that matters more than the actual temperature, right? That's the, the what, what it feels like is what you're building, you're, you're inside of your home or apartment or whatever it is, is dealing with. So demand went to really high levels. The temperature was so bitter cold and the wind chills were so bitter cold that a lot of coal and gas plants were having problems. A lot of wells were free, were freezing off in the, in the Permian basin and, and probably in the Eagleford. I haven't seen the numbers for the Eagleford yet, but in the Permian, we know it dropped 20%. So all this stuff was going on, but man, was wind strong. 
And we had, I mean, power never got above $50 a megawatt hour, even when demand spiked up well north of 70 gigawatts. I think it reached 73 that night. Um, Power never got expensive. The lines of supply and demand never got close to each other. Fast forward to the next day, the sun's coming up. The wind is starting to go down. It's still pretty strong in the morning time at that morning peak uh, when we hit, I think, 74 gigawatts. Wind was still not as strong as it was during the night, but still very strong. Sun's coming up. The, so the wind kind of carried us overnight. Sun carried us during the day. Um, and meanwhile, power plants are really struggling. They're scrambling to get them back on, but they've actually got time to fix them because we've got so much wind and solar on the system. And by nighttime, when the sun's down and the wind had died down, gas was carrying us, right? And so like we can't, we, and, and it's just a fact, like some people, there's some people out there that don't like wind. You have to acknowledge wind played a huge role and plays a huge role every day in helping keep power prices low for Texans. There was a study uh, done by um, Josh Rhodes of Ideasmiths, $7 billion in savings to the market through the first eight months of 2022 alone, over $20 billion over the last eight years combined. So, you know, you've, you you have to acknowledge those facts. And if you're a wind and solar, you know, lover of renewables and all that, you have to understand also that on these cold nights, when there is no sun and there is no wind, gas is pretty important to our system. Both of these things can be true. It's a complicated world. And I just think sometimes these these debates are just too reductive. One other thing that you just recently wrote about was on the demand side that houses in Texas are probably not up to spec or could use some retrofitting in order to decrease demand during these whipsaw moments. Can you uh, go over that a little bit and then tell us about how it interacts with the supply side? Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, where obviously this is the mining pod, we should talk about demand flexibility and demand response too, but energy efficiency and demand response to me, this is like, it's like, you know, peanut butter and jelly, Penn and Teller, Sonny and Cher, whatever you want to say, right? They just, they go together so nicely. Um, they one, one supports the other. So let's talk about energy efficiency for a minute. So in Texas, um, we have about uh, 10 million homes, uh, roughly. It's right about that. It's growing. It's a, such a fast growing state, but we're at about 10 million homes. Two thirds of those homes were built before there was a statewide building code. Most of, and even after there was a building code, we've had very, very spotty code enforcement, code compliance over the last 20 years. So a vast majority of buildings in Texas have wholly inadequate insulation. And for anybody that like doesn't live and breathe this stuff and doesn't think of this, a very easy way to think of insulation is the thermos for your coffee or the beer koozie for your beer, right? You put that coffee in a cup and you just leave it open to the air. Your coffee is going to be cold in 15 minutes, right? You put it in a thermos, you put that lid on there, that thermos is insulated. It's still hot a couple hours later, right? Our homes are the same way. If you don't have insulation, it's like putting that coffee or put you know into an open container and it's just going to all that heat is just going right to the outside same with single pane windows same with the metal frames all that stuff just leaching your hot air to the outside and and what does this do number 1 it drives demand really high number 2 it wastes money by driving up people's energy bills and number 3 it makes it very peril sometimes perilous sometimes literally lethal for people inside their homes in the event of a power outage right we saw this all through the state during Yuri and even unfortunately during Elliot um, when you know gas pressure dropped for whatever reason we don't know yet in the Atmos system which is like north texas and some of central texas and people inside their homes are sending out pictures of their thermostats dropping from, you know, the low 70s or high 60s or wherever they had it well into the 50s in a matter of hours. Why does that happen? That's because you're putting your coffee into a cup with that's not, you know, it's just open and has no, ins it's, you don't have a thermos for your house. You don't have insulation. So you're losing all of that. So that's a big deal. Um, the other part of energy efficiency that's really important to understand, I'll mention two other things. One is resistance heat. So in, in, in the state of Texas, um, we have, um, according to the Department of Energy, about three and a half million homes that have a secondary form of heat, which is called resistance heat. This is basically, the, the technology is basically a hairdryer, right? It's basically a toaster oven coil with a fan blowing over it. And so old and efficient heat pumps, and we want to differentiate because the newer heat pumps are incredibly efficient and can operate down below zero. Lots of people during the storm, uh, particularly I saw one in the Denver area was saying at negative 15 degrees in Denver, his heat pump was having no problem keeping his 
well insulated home, nice and warm and toasty inside. So, but these older heat pumps, their design value is only to heat down to 32. Once you hit 32, electric resistance heat kicks in. And it's not, it's in this is it, this is in the FERC and NERC report too, right? They cited this as a as one of the problems during the outages. And this is their words, a non-linear increase in demand as temperatures drop. So we're getting this kind of exponential increase that happens. So when you so when you get down, and this happened in Texas again just a couple of weeks ago, when we were down to 15 degrees throughout most of the state. Uh, ERCOT thought we would need 57 gigawatts. We needed over 70. They missed by 23%. And FERC and NERC, one of, they had 28 recommendations in the report. One of those recommendations was have specialists on your staff that understand the demand side and understand the demand draws of electric resistance heat. I have not gotten an answer yet, but I do not believe ERCOT did that. If they did, whoever they hired has not done their job well enough yet. Hopefully they hired somebody and I just don't know about it, but I'm not holding my breath. I don't think they've hired anybody and they need to do this. Last thing I'll say about energy efficiency, um, Texas was the first state to adopt an energy efficiency resource standard. California had been implementing energy efficiency programs, but Texas took this uh, uh, strategy of establishing a goal. Let's set a clear numerical marker and goal that is required for our utilities to meet. They set this in 1999. The goal was increased in 2007. It was increased again in 2011 by the PUC. 2007 was the legislature. 2011 was the PUC. It hasn't been touched since. So we are now 12 years from the time that the goal for energy efficiency in the state of Texas has been increased. During that time, 27 other states have copied Texas and and adopted energy efficiency goals. Texas's goal is dead last of those 27 states, and our goal is 80% below the average state. Not the leading state, we are 80% below the average state with a goal. And so I contend that we will always have these problems in the winter until we aggressively address energy efficiency, resistance heat, insulation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the data is there, and I, I, I've seen some of your tweets uh, rolling that out, and I'll definitely link your latest article in our show notes for anyone who wants to take a look at that. When I'm looking at the problem, however, just as a layman or someone who's kind of walking into the situation, it's pretty overwhelming. And I have to bet that ERCOT, PC, governor's office, legislature is looking at this and being like, do we fix the supply side first? Do we fix the demand side? Like, How do we interact with all these utilities? There's private companies involved. From your perspective... What does a solution look like? So first of all, I think I think you're right. And I want to acknowledge that this is complicated and that I would imagine many of the public utility commissioners and staff are feeling extremely overwhelmed. They've had a lot thrown at them. The legislature passed a lot. They On an average year, they're doing six to eight rulemakings. I believe they did 30 in 2022. Um, they didn't get much of an increase in appropriation. They are woefully understaffed. Um, the Sunset Commission does a top to bottom review of the agency uh, every 12 years. The legislature decided to speed that up. They said, I believe their phrase was woefully underfunded, something along those lines. Um, so I do think everybody's feeling overwhelmed, and I want to acknowledge that they've got a very, very difficult job, and I don't envy them the job they have. Legislature, the same. They've got to deal with dozens, scores, hundreds of issues. This is this is but one, but it's a really important one. Um, I will say I think that the I do think the PUC is going about this the wrong way because I think they have spent much of their time over the last eighteen months uh, as a brand new commission right all of all of the others uh, resigned they you know um, and, and it's a brand new commission but over the last eighteen months they have spent much of their time focused on market redesign I don't think the problem that we have in Texas is fundamentally a market problem that is not to say that our market is perfect doesn't need some changes it it does. And it's had some changes. Uh, We could talk about what changes those are. But I think fundamentally, actually, the the market is sound. I think the problem is we don't have adequate regulation of gas supply, uh, gas pipelines, um, or of gas power plants. I think that we've the, the PUC has made some strides on the power plants, but we saw, unfortunately, last week that they have not gone far enough and more will need to be done on that. So I look at this as... Here's another an analogy that I like to use, right? If if um, 
let's, let's look at like a good example, I think would be like hamburger joints, right? Like you want a wide variety of different hamburger places you can go to. You, you'd like to have as much choice as possible. That competition is good in the marketplace. Same with generation sources, same with retail. Like we like that, that, that competition. We like for the market to bring different um, flavors in, right? All that. And if you're going to a burger joint, you'd like to know that a health inspector has been there. You'd like to know that somebody looked around and made sure there's not like mice and cockroaches climbing over your food, right? You'd like to know that the staff is wearing hair nets and that they wash their hands and right. So we have to understand that again, sometimes this stuff is too reductive. Like we need a whole like government system to run our power grid. Look at Tennessee Valley Authority. Like if you're if you're somebody who's like pro clean energy and you think that the government's going to take all this over and you're going to get a bunch of clean energy, like Look at TVA in Texas. Look at LCRA. There, the, these they they that's a government agency. They've basically done nothing for renewables. They're holding on to their 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 fossil plants and doing very little to to innovate. And by the way, having their power plants break down during freezes. TVA had rolling outages. LCRA had a bunch of their plants go out. I don't think government ownership is 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 the answer. Now the other side of this is like free markets will solve all problems. No. Free markets will not solve all problems. Sometimes there are market failures, and sometimes you just need a regulator to say, in a case where the public health and public safety is at risk, there are certain bare minimum standards you must meet, like a a restaurant must meet certain health inspection standards. Same with the gas supply system. If we're going to rely on gas in the wintertime, and I actually think that's there, there's, there's a lot of different ways to go with this, but for the foreseeable future, we're going to need gas in the wintertime. There's just no doubt about it. I mean, it's just, we have to be pragmatic about this stuff and gas is a really important resource. So if we're going to rely on it for our lives, literally, uh, then there better be some inspections to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Now, the Railroad Commission will say we're, we do inspections, but again, you know, we, we just had a cold event with no snow and ice. And production from the Permian dropped by 22%, by 3.4 billion cubic feet per day um, without any snow and ice. That is alarming and is a clear data point that whatever they're doing is not working, so we need more of it. And then the other thing which we were just talking about is they should directly address the demand side. They need to, they, and, and again, there are so many benefits from doing that. Very few people realize this. But today, there are nearly, not quite, but nearly as many energy efficiency workers in the state of Texas as there are oil and gas workers in the state of Texas. Not a knock against oil and gas. There's almost 200,000 oil and gas workers, and those people are very important. Their families and their livelihoods are important. And God bless those people for being out there in those fields, keeping gas flowing during that winter cold spell. It's nothing against them. It's just a lot of, I'm just trying to lift up another industry, right, that often doesn't get heralded nearly as much. There's a lot of energy efficiency workers out there day in, day out, helping make our houses more comfortable, helping keep our uh, our energy bills lower. And, and we could grow that segment very rapidly. As a matter of fact, the Inflation Reduction Act and some of these federal incentives that are coming will do that. Um, the tax credits that are coming will, will increase that workforce tremendously. We can grow jobs. We can help lower people's energy bills, which acts, by the way, is a stimulant for the economy because when your energy bills go down, that's one of those kinds of stimulus that you don't necessarily see. If your your electric bill, you know, most of Texans are living hand to mouth, day to day, week to week, paycheck to paycheck, and when their energy bill goes from three hundred dollars a month to two hundred dollars a month through energy efficiency, that extra hundred bucks is probably something they're going to spend. So it's actually a stimulant for the economy, helps save people money on their energy bills, and not to be lost here makes their house more survivable if there is an outage, makes their house more comfortable on a day-to-day basis and more healthy for the occupants inside. That indoor air quality actually improves. So there's just so many benefits for the for the conversation we're having. The number one benefit here is you avoid those really, really high peaks on the hottest winter day, <laughs> hottest summer days and coldest winter days. So regulation and energy efficiency, but we didn't talk about new generation. I'm curious to get your opinion on that. Does a Texas grid need additional generation? And if so, what what sources should be pulled from? Uh, So uh, it's interesting. This is a really interesting one. The the ERCOT grid is getting a whole lot of 
uh, investment and generation. Most of it is going to wind and solar and we're getting a ton of storage. We're up to three gigawatts. That is, we had during this last cold snap, which was only what, 22 months after Yuri, we had 10 times the amount of storage on the grid. So this whole thing that we're not getting the investment is is just not true. There's a ton of investment and there's gas, right? There's a company called Wattbridge that has built many gigawatts of gas. I think the number is something like two or three gigawatts over just the last couple of years of gas. So we're getting gas as well. By the way, the newest plants, the 10 that they completed last year did not work during this last cold snap. During the night, Again, when the wind was blowing strong, so we were fine, but they they didn't work. They got them operating, so they were ready for the next night. Again, it's an integrated system. So, um, but I, I think it, I think the the there's a bit of a this is a really interesting thing in Texas, right? We are this is a state that has prided itself on not picking winners and losers, on having competitive markets. Um, it's very interesting to me to hear so many Republican leaders talk about central planning. This is what they want to do. When they say we need to build more gas plants, they're trying to centrally plan ERCOT. I mean, they're ba- conservative leaders of Texas are basically taking a Soviet style to energy planning. Let's have a five-year plan and just pick which generation sources and where they should go, and, and we'll just pay for them. I, It's stunning to me. If you would have told me 10 years ago that elected officials in Texas, Republican elected officials would be calling for a centrally planned energy system, I would have said, no, 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 they can't. Not here. That no, no, no. That may happen with Republicans in other states, not in Texas. No, that sounds like a like a New England Republican thing, not a not a Texas Republican thing. But but that's what's happening. It's 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 bizarre to me. I can't I can't believe what I'm what I'm seeing happen on a day to day basis. I, for one, I I do think that the market will send the signals that are needed, and it is sending the signals. Again, I want to be very careful so nobody takes anything like out of context here. You have to have the regulation to make sure that the gas supply is strong and um, ready to go and resilient in the face of this extreme weather, and that those power plants are the same. We had enough to get through this cold snap. We didn't have a huge margin on, and, and in fact, you know, the ERCOT CEO sent a, a letter to the Department of Energy asking for a waiver of emissions controls because he said we were in an emergency situation in the letter. Um, so, you know, things were a little bit tight for sure, but we never went into an emergency alert. I mean, I, and that was with. 11 or at its peak, I believe about 12 and a half gigawatts. To put that in perspective, the entire Houston area is about 12 gigawatts. Austin's about three and a half. So three or four Austin's worth of coal and gas plants were offline and we still made it through. So why are we building new? Why don't we fix what we've got, make sure it's operational and ready to go? And by the way, making a lot of money, you know, a lot of folks complain that, you know, we need gas when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. Guess when the prices are the highest? When the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. So there's a lot of money to be made for these thermal plants. And I I think what's going on here really is just the incumbent generators are trying to change the market to get more money for their power plants or for, or in some cases for new power plants. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would just, I would just wrap that up by saying, I almost think there's a little bit of a fallacy in the question, which is that any human being, myself included, could know exactly what the grid needs. I don't trust myself that much. I actually believe in markets. I believe in designing markets to send signals rather than any person or group of people saying, oh, we have perfect foresight. Let's go with this one. No one has perfect foresight. So we rely on markets to send signals to give us the investment that we need. Um, and just like with hamburger joints, the market sends signals and you can tell how much the public wants hamburgers, right? You also need some regulation to make sure that the that they are operated safely with the public interest in mind. I think the power, the power system is similar in that regard. We need better regulation, but not necessarily a market that just throws out market principles and competition and just says, we're going to pay this resource over that. I don't think that's a good way to go. 
I want to get some thoughts on the market structure that they're talking about. Uh, but before that, I want to talk about the centralization risk that you just cited there, which I think a lot of Bitcoin miners are actually somewhat worried about. I wouldn't maybe anxious is a better word because I think it's a little bit too far off in the future for them to be quite concerned now. But Bitcoin obviously always wants decentralization in everything, even if there's a trade off there. And I think some of them are getting worried that it might get pushed off the grid or there's going to be a centralization, like a top down structure for a Texas grid in the future that uh, de incentivizes them to move there or even just to leave the Texas grid entirely. Do you see a future where the Texas grid is becoming centralized just because of the political pressures from the deaths from uh, winters from Yuri or from the recent cold snap or maybe a future incident? I don't think that that's super likely, but I think it is certainly one of many possible outcomes. I mean, it is certainly one of many possible outcomes because there are folks that are clamoring for that. Um, I mean, we saw during the last legislative session, a huge push from Berkshire Hathaway to just have the state write them an $8 billion check or $9 billion, whatever it was, to build like 10 gas plants. And there were a fair number of legislators that supported that. Again, a lot of quote unquote, conservative Republicans that were just deciding that, yeah, we'll just, we'll just centrally plan. So, and then, and then of course that cost gets, so, you know, spread out overall load and in, in including Bitcoin, but not just Bitcoin, obviously everybody would pay that cost. Um, I, it's, you know, it's hard for me to say, I, if you ask me to make a prediction, which way this is going to go, I'll, I'll be wrong. So I won't make a prediction. I would just say that, that that is a real uh, concern. I think if people are feeling anxious about that, they're right to feel that way. I think there's a, a whole lot of very powerful folks that would like to just throw out this competitive market structure um, and just go to some kind of a centrally planned um, system or you know, maybe a step short of central planning, but basically a capacity market. And a capacity market is a form of central planning because you've got an administrator saying, Here's how much demand we're going to need. And, you know, it's, 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 it moves the, those kinds of structures, like a capacity market structure, a load serving entity obligation, this new performance credit mechanism that, that the chairman of this PUC is, is touting. What it really does in my mind, all of these, I'm lumping them together and there's certainly nuanced differences to each, but, but as a general matter, what it does is it moves the focus from the market where buyers and sellers are finding each other and negotiating the best deals for each other, from each other, right? With each other. That's what a market does. It moves that focus to the administrator. So another analogy I like to use is like, now the game is not about the players on the court, it's about the refs. And who can work the refs most to their benefit? You see that sometimes in NBA games, right? Especially in the NBA. But anywhere where like all of a sudden the refs are calling so many fouls and the players are paying so much attention to the refs that it's not even about the players anymore. It's about who can get the call. That's what happens in these kinds of administrative markets, right? It's all about what does ERCOT tell you? What is the resource accreditation for your resource? I'm going to say it's 20% for solar, 12% for wind, 80% for gas. Never mind that gas didn't work at 80% during the the during URI, but I'm just going to decide it's 80. And then somebody says, well, I don't like that. And they hire lobbyists and they try to work that ref to make it the best they can possibly get it. I think we're better served by having a true marketplace where buyers and sellers find each other. And it is more decentralized in that sense. There's obviously a central clearinghouse, whether that be ERCOT or, or ICE, the Inter Intercontinental Exchange, those kinds of things. But but it's it's more about the players on the field than it is about the refs. So moving on to the marketplace, uh, this recent SARA report was interesting to me because of the Bitcoin mining, obviously, as a Bitcoin mining fan, but also the batteries that was mentioned within the report. Curious to get your thoughts on that, flexible loads, the ability to store energy on the grid. These seem to be some things that ERCOT is looking at more and more as a way to protect the grid. But I'd be curious to get your thoughts on how ERCOT thinks about these things or someone in the energy industry such as yourself thinks about these flexible loads like Bitcoin mining or batteries or other things of that nature that store energy. 
Yeah. So um, it's interesting. I I think of storage and and flexible loads in different in different categories myself. And what I may be wrong in that, and you feel free to tell me. No, no, no. You should think of them the same, and we can we can we can get into that. But but in my in my head, they're they're in separate categories. And and I think of flexible loads, by the way, as being a huge category of different things. So Bitcoin mining is certainly one of them. Um, data centers of all kinds could be flexible loads. Um, hydrogen production. I think we're going to have a lot of electrolysis in the state um, in a, in a, I don't know, I don't know what time frame. probably five to 10 years. Maybe, maybe that's too pessimistic. Maybe it happens a little quicker than that, but I think we'll have a lot of green hydrogen in the state. Direct air capture. There's already um, a project um, that is in the works out in West Texas. Um, we have all sorts of uh, caverns and geological formations to, to store carbon. And basically, it's very energy intensive to pull uh, carbon out of the air. There's not that much of it, right? The 400 parts per million you hear, right? It's just that, think about that, just 400 parts per million. There's just not that much of it. So you have to pull a lot out of the air just to get those 400 parts. I think we're up to 420 or something now. So I guess, unfortunately, it's getting easier. But um, but it's still right, very energy intensive. And if you set up a big machine to pull carbon out of the air and store it underground, is there any reason you would need to do that on a on a hundred degree day when when power is scarce? Is there any reason you would need to do that on a zero degree day when power is scarce? No, you could you could turn off that carbon. So that, that carbon capture machine. So I think there's going to be a lot of flexible loads. This one sort of straddles the flexible load and storage um, electric vehicle fleets, right? There's going to be a, a very flexible way that those can charge. You don't necessarily need to charge them. You certainly don't need to charge them in hours of scarcity. And we're not that far away from reversing that flow and being able to put those that that power back onto the grid. And when you start to think about this, that you know what's coming down the pike here. Um, Ford F one fifties that come standard with ninety eight kWh. I mean, average home is using thirty to forty kWh. A big home using thirty to forty kWh in a day. Um, two days worth of power and a battery under the hood. I mean, you know, and, and you know, school buses five hundred kWh. You could literally power ten to twelve houses for a day with a battery in a single school bus. I mean, you start to think about this, it's mind boggling, right? Um, so we start having two-way flows. So th- those flexible loads are coming. And I think it is, I-, I can't possibly overstate this, how critical I think flexible loads are to the future of the grid. And I'm not opining on on Bitcoin or anything like that. Bitcoin is a flexible load, right? I, I Whatever anybody out there thinks about Bitcoin, these kinds of flexible loads are coming, and and the and and I think Bitcoin actually is in some ways, it's the bleeding edge probably of a lot of different things, but it's it's it is the bleeding edge I think also of these really large loads that don't need to operate twenty four seven and have that flexibility to turn off and allow power to flow to to where it's most needed. It's it's the first really big one, but I don't think it's the last. Um, LNG exports, right? Uh, the the Freeport one that that's been offline for the past few months. My understanding is that's grid powered. That they don't have their own generation on site, and they're drawing 700 megawatts. I sure hope somebody's got an agreement from them to shut down if it's 105 degrees and we're about to go into rolling outages. You know, uh, in Houston or Dallas, right? So so large flexible loads are coming. They're going to be a part of the grid, and they are they are. Again, not, we don't want to be reductive. It's a complicated system. Let's stop thinking good or bad. Let's think about how can they be used and integrated in a way that increases resilience, increases the reliability of the system. That's what we need to do with flexible loads. Storage, like I said earlier, we're 10x the amount of storage. I think we're going to double that in the next 12 months or so. Um, you know, I, we're going to have wild amounts of storage on the grid, and that's it's it's a great thing. I think it will along with demand flexibility, largely solve our summer problems. So all again, all this angst about market design, I think most of the summer problems can be solved between a mix of energy efficiency, demand flexibility, and storage. Winter problems are harder. Um, but, I, but I think the summer problems, because you're usually talking about an hour or two period where demand's really high and the sun went down, maybe three or four hours. But again, a mix of energy efficiency, demand response, and, and storage can handle that. Last question as we wrap up here. Looking into 2023, 
what are you expecting to get done with all these commissions working together? We've had a few reports recently, which your Twitter feed is a, a great place for anyone who's interested in following up on this. Uh, go give Doug a follow. But what are you expecting in 2023 based on what we've seen over the last few months and the debates going on with the governor's office, legislature, railroad commission, all these other agencies? Yeah, it's a great question. And 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 the short answer is I don't have an I any idea. Like it is it is wild. Like this, the, there have been so many twists and turns in this thing. If you would have t- asked me this question two months ago, uh literally two months ago, I would have told you, well, the PUC is about to recommend the load serving entity obligation. And then um not only did the PUC not recommend it, the consultant they hired uh ostensibly to write a report to recommend the LSEO. They didn't either. So uh there's a lot of twists and turns on this road. And then and then they came out with something totally different that nobody'd ever heard of before called the performance credit mechanism. So you know I don't know who's going to come up with the next thing next and and where that will take us. I do think on January 12th there is a meeting that the Public Utility Commission is having. They sort of mark that date on the calendar to talk about market design. I think that they will probably adopt um, uh, some kind of a performance credit mechanism as a sort of a principle. I say adopt it, not rule language, not finalized, but basically just say, this is what we intend to do. It's very clear the the legislature, at least the Senate side, does not want them to do that. The the Senate uh, Business Commerce Committee, all nine members, six Republicans, three Democrats, signed a letter to the Public Utility Commission telling them not to move forward with the performance credit mechanism. So it'll be interesting to see how how that conflict um, plays out. But um, I think that'll happen. And then from there, who knows? I mean, the the legislature is a a crapshoot. Who knows what they're going to do? uh, I, I think they will have some very. I think there will be robust discussions and and debates around um, a, a few different things during the legislative session. You'll see a lot around transmission, which is a very big need on the system. Um, the PUC deserves credit for uh, you know green lighting a new transmission line going down to South Texas, which will be done in 2026, maybe probably 2027. This is the thing about transmission; it takes a long time. So you know we really need some some more action there. I expect a lot of discussion around energy efficiency and demand response. I don't know that anything will get done there. Not super optimistic given the legislature hasn't acted in so long, but, you know, um, some hope. And then there'll be a lot of discussion around economic incentives. Uh, You know, what used to be chapter 313s that, that expire at the end of 2022 a successor to that. And then the market design discussions will, will be ongoing. And I just, it is very hard to read where the legislature is on this right now. I don't think legislative leadership by and large knows where they are on this. And that's, I don't say that as a criticism. It's again, it's complicated. They should take time to figure it out, but um, there are, you know, a thousand different ways this could go. And I just don't know. Doug, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Where can people find your work? I know you have a podcast and newsletter and a pretty fantastic Twitter feed. So tell us about that. Thanks so much for that question. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so the the podcast is called the Texas Power Podcast, produced uh, by Renewable Energy World. Um, you can find that by looking at Renewable Energy World's uh, website. I've also got a link to it on the link tree that's in the bio of my um, Twitter. So my Twitter handle is Doug Lewin Energy. Please find me there. And then I also have a sub stack, which is just, you can find that Doug Lewin, D-O-U-G-L-E-W-I-N. And yeah, that's probably enough. Uh, you can, I'm on LinkedIn too, but I always look for, I always love to hear from people. So anything I said stimulates a question or whatever, um, uh, please shoot me a note. I look forward to hearing from you. And thank you so much for having me on. Really appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you, Doug. Talk to you soon. Thank you.